Good evening. I'm Alexander Rose. I'm the executive director here at the Lung Now Foundation. Um, just want to make a couple announcements of some other talks we have coming up at uh, the interval. On Tuesday, the 20th, we have Matthew Victor, uh, formerly with uh, Jeff Kuhn's studio, building all the crazy things that Jeff Kuhn's had to build. Uh, that talk is called Artists with Lasers. There are still talk, uh, tickets available for that. He's going to be talking about the history of artists and technology. Um, should be a fantastic talk. The other, the next talk after that is going to be uh, Stuart Brand and Paul Sappho in conversation talking about uh, pace layer thinking. And some of you may remember this pace layer diagram that was in Stuart's book, um, talking about the human layers of time and the layers of time in civilization. And it's been 15 years since that was published and a lot of people use it as, uh, as kind of a way of thinking about the world and design and all kinds of things. And so we're gonna be having a conversation on that. Now that talk sold out in like two hours. Um, the interval only holds about 100 people. Uh, but actually I wanted to find out how many people have used the live streaming that we do of these talks. Okay, so not that many of you. It is probably our most underused, awesome thing that we have. Um, the, what we are going to do for that interval talk, we haven't live stream, we live stream these all the time uh, to our members. And uh, that interval talk will also be live streamed and we'll try and get pictures up of the slides if there are slides and, and pictures up of the venue. Um, so any member can tune into that talk on January 27th at uh, 7.30 p.m. Pacific time. And I know we have a lot of, uh, a lot of the people who do uh, watch these talks on simulcast are from Australia and Japan and, uh, and Hawaii. They seem to be in the, the better time zone for, for listening. The next thing I wanna talk about is tonight's long short. Uh, as you know, we generally uh, show a short video uh, about long-term thinking, and we usually find a, a subject associated with the, the speaker. Tonight, um, we have an early release of, a, of an update on the 10,000-year clock project. Uh, those of you who have been following along with the 10,000-year clock project that we've been working on at Long Now for decades, um, we haven't had an update uh, to you in quite a while, and we wanted to get more done before sending something out. One of the most monumental problems of this monument uh, building exercise has been how do we build the underground space where the 10,000 year clock is going to go? And uh, we actually used a, bo a raised bore system, which some of you may have seen the video that we did release several years ago, of pulling a 12 and a half foot diameter uh, drill bit through 500 feet of solid rock. Um, that is where the clock is gonna go, but the way you're going to visit it, we had designed a, a special staircase where every single step was cut in a different way, three-dimensionally sculpted out of that living rock um, for 300 vertical feet. And there was basically no technology, no normal mining technology or no uh, normal um, quarrying technology that we could use. So we worked with this amazing studio called Seattle Solstice up in Seattle who um, appropriated a, a diamond quarrying saw and we built a 27,000 pound robot that has been working for the last year making 300 vertical feet of stairs. Take a look.
Good evening. I'm Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. Western Europe is one of the most densely populated places in the world and has been for a very long time. Um, there's very few national parks, almost no large protected areas like there are in North America or in Africa. And yet something that's been going on for the last few years now is that Europe is being re-infiltrated, re-occupied by wolves and brown bears and lynxes. And so the whole trophic cascade that goes with getting these apex predators back on the landscape densely blended in with the people who are welcoming them much more than we do in North America. And this is happening pretty much by itself as a byproduct of people moving to the cities. There's a lot of abandoned farmland, grazing land, and orchards, and uh, that goes to forest, and then the animals move in pretty quickly. Uh, there's also some intentional work. There's been reintroduction of beavers into places like Sweden. They're coming to Scotland. Uh, there's just last couple of weeks ago, reintroduction of the Spanish ibex into the Pyrenees. And the animals are finding their way back, and the people are finding the way to be comfortable living with them. This is not part of one of the standard narratives about human relations with nature right now. Uh, it's not being done by one of the standard organizations that we deal with. Uh, and it's happening somewhere not here. There's so much of that kind of thing going on, some of it bad news, some of it good news, that we just don't know about, and they're not part of the narratives. And one of the reasons I really value Jesse Ossipal is he looks globally for what's really going on, on the ground, in relations between people and nature. And that's what he'll, he'll be talking about tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks to Stuart and to Ryan Fallon and the Long Now Foundation for this opportunity to speak with you. Uh, this evening I'll speak about trends, uh, mostly in America, but that trends that may portend a global restoration of nature, a rebound. Go Warriors! Um, <laughs> this work is a collective effort with uh, my friends and colleagues uh, Alan Curry, Cesare Marchetti, Perrin Meyer, who's with us this evening, Paul Wagner, and Ido Wernick. Uh, well, let's go into the woods. Uh, to begin with a scary side effect relating to what Stuart just mentioned, a scary side effect of the American trend to expand nature, illustrated only about 45 miles northwest of New York City in New Jersey. Uh, this past September, a bear killed Darsh Patel, age 22, a senior at Rutgers University, Rutgers College, uh, majoring in information technology, uh, while he was hiking with friends. Uh, Patel's death in the Apshawa Preserve was the first fatal bear attack in New Jersey in 150 years. Uh, five friends were actually hiking together when they came across the bear. Uh, they reacted first by photographing and filming it, here you see a still, uh, before running in different directions. And after they regrouped, they noticed that one of their number was missing. Uh, state authorities found and euthanized the bear, which had human remains in its stomach and esophagus and human blood and tissue under its claws. Now, five years earlier, the state of New Jersey had restored its bear hunt. Uh, and in fact, in 2010, wildlife biologists had estimated that there were 3,400 3, bears living in New Jersey. And after five years of hunting, the experts now estimate that the population is about 2,500 still. And during the six-day hunting season uh, just a few months ago in 2014, in six days, hunters killed 267 black bears in the state of New Jersey. Uh, protesters have picketed and petitioned to stop the annual hunt. Well, should the rewilding of New Jersey shock us? 
And I answer no, because in fact, about 1970, a great reversal began in America's use of resources. And contrary to the expectation of many professors and preachers, America began to spare more resources for the rest of nature, first in relative and more recently in absolute terms. A series of decouplings is occurring so that our economy no longer advances in tandem with exploitation of land, forests, water, and minerals. American use of almost everything except information seems to be peaking not because the resources are exhausted, but because consumers changed consumption and producers changed production. Changes in behavior and technology liberate the environment. Well, first consider land. Uh, agriculture has always been the greatest raper of nature, stripping and simplifying and regimenting it and reducing acreage left. Then, in about 1940, acreage and yield decoupled, as this figure dramatically shows. And since about 1940, American farmers have quintupled corn while using the same or even less land. Now, corn matters because it towers over other crops, as you see here. The total tons of corn are more than wheat, soy, rice, and potatoes all together. Now, it's crucial to note that the rising yields have not required more tons of fertilizer or other inputs. This figure shows the plateau and then fall of agricultural inputs, not just cropland, but nitrogen, phosphates, potash, and even water, to which I will return in the talk. A recent meta-analysis by a pair of German researchers of 147 original studies of recent trends in high-yield farming for soy, corn, and cotton, funded by the German government and the European Union, uh, 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 found a 37% decline in chemical pesticide use, while crops rose 22%. The story is precision agriculture, in which we use more bits and not more kilowatts or gallons. Importantly, the average yield of the excuse me, the average yield of American farmers or world farmers is nowhere near a ceiling. In 2013, David Hula, a farmer in the Virginia Tidewater, not in Iowa or Illinois, grew a world record 454 bushels per acre, which is more than three times the average Iowa grower. And you can see here that his cab looks like the office of a high-speed trader. Uh, this year, in 2014, his yield rose another 5% to 476 bushels, while uh, Randy Dowdy, who farms near Valdosta, Georgia, not a place you think of for corn, in fact, busted the 500 bushel wall for the first time with a yield of 503 bushels per acre and won the National Corn Growers Contest. So the ceiling is up here and rising, and the averages are here. There's a, a huge amount of headroom for people still to lift yields in America or in the world. So the world average corn yields are about half of the average American, which are a third or a quarter of what the top, top farmers are doing. Now, of course, one can ask if Americans need all that corn. Uh, we eat only a small fraction as corn on the cob or creamed corn or as tortillas or polenta. Uh, more, most corn, in fact, becomes uh, beef or pork, as you see in the green here on this slide. And increasingly, we feed it to cars, as you see in the, the red. And in fact, an area the size of all of Iowa or all of Alabama grows corn only to fuel vehicles. Well, unlike uh, corn that becomes beef or soybeans, uh, uh, or soybeans become chicken, potatoes stay potatoes. I'm a potato guy, I uh, really like potatoes. And potatoes are important also because uh, they can, if you conserve potatoes, then you conserve the scarce input of water in places like Idaho or California's Kern County around uh, Bakersfield. But ponder what's happened uh, to corn growers and the, the rewards of success of the potato grower. Here you see in red that the corn growers again have lifted yields, but their markets are saturated, uh, even for French fries and potato chips. 
So what they've done is remove land from production in green. And of course, this land and water sparing also is a gift for other plants and animals. Well, steadily also, uh, the conversion of crops, mostly corn, to meat has also decoupled because the meat game is also one in which efficiency matters. Uh, now, from humanity's point of view, uh, cattle, pigs, and chickens are just machines to make meat. Uh, and if you think of them as sort of like uh, model cars, a steer gets about 12 miles to the gallon, while a pig gets about 40, and a chicken gets about 60. And if you look at the statistics for America and the world, they show that poultry, which are land's uh, efficient meat machines, they're the smart car, uh, they're winning. Uh, you can, if you want to make a pound of meat, it's much better to take some soybeans and a, a chicken or a turkey uh, than it is to take a cow. And so all over the world, and in, in the same way that, uh, that uh, MP3s uh, beat uh, CDs, which beat tapes, which beat records, uh, chicken uh, as meat machine is, is uh, winning. And they're basically, you know, you're going to a Toyota Prius from, from uh, a Cadillac. And the, the, farmers, the farmers understand this. Uh, there might be lots of other rationalizations having to do with, from physicians and so forth, but don't believe it. Uh, well, uh, of course, the point is that high grain and cereal yields and efficient meat machines combine to spare land for nature. In fact, we've argued that both the US and the world are at peak farmland not because of exhaustion of arable land, but because farmers are wildly successful in producing protein and calories. To prosper, farmers have forced Americans to eat hamburgers and chicken tenders, to drink bourbon, and to drive with ethanol. And they have still exported massive tonnages abroad. Now, it's important to note that wasted food is not decoupled from acreage. And when we consider the horror of food waste, either left in the fields, uh, or at the table, and not to mention obesity, then we further appreciate that huge amounts of land can be released from agriculture with no damage to human diet. In fact, every year, 1.3 billion tons of food are thrown away globally, according to UN statistics, and that equates to about one-third of the world's food being wasted. Now, some waste food is because of carelessness, but laws and rules regulating food distribution also cause it. Uh, Germany, the UK, and other countries are changing rules to reduce food waste. And here in California, there are websites like Food Cowboy, which uses mobile technology to root soup surplus food from wholesalers and restaurants to food banks and soup kitchens instead of to landfills. And there's also Crop Mobster, which tries to spread news about local food excess and surplus from suppliers. Uh, uh, the 800 million or so hungry humans are not hungry because of inadequate production. Well, uh, if we keep lifting average yields, that to the demonstrated levels of uh, David Hula and Randy Dowdy, if we stop feeding corn to cars, if we restrain our diets lightly, and if we reduce waste, then according to calculations that uh, we've published in recent years, an area the size of India or the US east of the Mississippi, or even more, could be released globally from agriculture over the next 50 years or so. There's plenty of calories and protein out there, probably well, much, much more than we need to grow. And in fact, rebound is already happening. Uh, abandonment of marginal agricultural lands in the former Soviet Union in Eastern Europe has released at least 30 million and perhaps as much as 60 million hectares to return to nature. Uh, 30 million hectares is the size of Poland or Italy. Stuart mentioned this. The great reversal of land use that I'm describing is not something hypothetical. It's, not all, it's a forecast. It's a present reality in Russia and Poland, as well as Pennsylvania and Michigan. And at the end of the talk, I'll show some of the consequences. I talked about corn. As I said, the total amount of corn fed to cars in America is equal to Iowa or Alabama. Think of organizations like Long Now turning all those lands that are now pasture for cars into refuges for wildlife, carbon orchards, and parks. The area is about twice the area of all the national parks in the states outside Alaska. 
Well, let's now turn from farms to forests. Foresters refer to a forest transition when a nation goes from losing to gaining forested area. And France recorded the first transition, the first forest transition, about the year 1830. And since that time, French forests have doubled, while French population has also doubled, as you see here. So forest area decoupled from population in France. Now, measured by growing stock, the U.S. enjoyed its forest transition around 1950, as you see on the right, and measured by area uh, about 1990, as you see, uh, excuse me, on the, the growing stock on the left and the timberland area on the right. Forests can spread, they can also become more dense. It's like a city. A city, can, you can have taller buildings and more, more uh, uh, high, a higher density in a city, or you can sp spread. So forests, you can get more forest in both, both ways. And both the area and the, the density are increasing in the U.S. and in about 60 other temperate countries, in fact. In the U.S., the forest transition began around 1900, when states such as Connecticut, in, in black here, 1907 or earlier, uh, and uh, Pennsylvania and New York, uh, started the transition. And you can see it spread so that now, in fact, forests appear to be increasing in at least all the lower 48 states. California joined uh, in 1997 from forest decrease to forest increase. Now, in fact, the thick green cover where I come from in New York or Pennsylvania or all of New England would, would have been unrecognizable to, uh, to uh, Teddy Roosevelt, one of the most famous conservationists. He knew, he knew the parts of the country that, uh, where I live and work as wheat fields, pastures mown by sheep, and hills denuded by logging. Now, it's important to understand that the forest transition, like peak farmland, involves forces of both supply and demand. Foresters manage the supply better through smarter harvesting and replanting. Simply shifting harvesting from uh, cool, slow-growing forests to warmer, faster-growing ones can make a difference. Growth in cool and warm U.S. forests differed recently by about a factor of two, about 3.6 cubic meters in the cool area, 7.4 in the, the warmer ones. And in fact, the shift of the U.S. forest industry to the southeast between 1976 and 2001, from the cool regions to the warmer ones, actually had caused a net decrease of logged area in the U.S. of about 3 million hectares, which is far more than the 0.9 million hectares of Yellowstone Park or the 1.3 million hectares of Connecticut. Now, like farmed meat, forest plantations also produce wood more efficiently than unmanaged forests. And forest plantations meet a growing fraction of demand all over the world, whether New Zealand, Brazil, US. And uh, they also meet that demand predictably. And they can spare other forests for biodiversity and other benefits. And the growth in plantations versus natural forests provides an even greater contrast than just the, co the cool and the warm. Brazilian eucalyptus plant, plant plantations provide about 40 cubic meters per hectare per year, about five times a warm natural forest and almost 10 times a cool northern forest. In recent times, about a third of wood production comes from plantations. And if that were to increase to 75%, then the logged area of natural forests could drop in half globally. Now, it's easy to appreciate. It's a very simple logic. If plantations merely grow twice as fast as natural forests, harvesting one hectare of plantation spares two hectares of natural forest. An equally important story unfolds on the demand side. We once used wood to heat our homes and for almost forgotten uses, such as railroad ties. The iron horse, the, the train, was actually a wooden horse with rails resting on countless trees that made the ties and trestles. And the trains themselves were wooden carriages. The, uh, the president, uh, as president of the Southern Pacific and Central Pacific Railroads in their largest expansion, one of your local heroes, Leland Stanford, was probably one of the greatest deforesters in world history. It's not surprising that he publicly advocated for conservation of forests because he knew how railroads cut them. The U.S. Forest Service originated around 1900 in large part owing to an expected timber famine 
caused by expansion of railroads. Fortunately for nature, the length of the railroad system saturated creosote, preserved timber longer, and concrete replaced it. This uh, chart shows the three major uses of wood, uh, fuel, construction, and paper, and it shows how wood for fuel and building has lost importance since 1960. And world production also has saturated. Here you see saw logs uh, in veneer and red, round wood in construction in blue, uh, wood fuel in green, and paper and paperboard in yellow. And you can see that the, the demand uh, since about 1990 for the round wood, the, uh, the uh, saw logs, and the wood fuel has been flat. Uh, it's not a good time to own shares in these companies. There was uh, a market for, for pulp and paper for a while, growing until the early 2000s. Uh, it had been the bright spot. But after decades of wrong forecasts of the paperless society, we must now credit West Coast tycoons Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos for e-readers and tablets, which have caused the market for pulp and paper, the last strong sector of wood products, to crumple. Where are the newsstands and stationers of yesteryear? Many paper products, such as steno pads and even fanfold computer paper, are artifacts for the technology museums. Email has collapsed mail, as this figure shows. As uh, uh, a Rockefeller University employee, I like to point out that John D. Rockefeller saved the whales by replacing sperm oil with petroleum. Well, ARPANET merits a medal for forest rebound. <laughs> well, so far I've described bottom-up uh, uh, forces relating to farms and forests that spare land, but top-down forces are also at work, and together the forces are causing global greening global greening, the most important ecological trend on Earth, or at least on land today. The biosphere on land is getting bigger year by year, about two billion tons or even more. And researchers are reporting the evidence weekly. Here are abstracts from half a dozen papers published in the last year or so. Uh, on the upper left, shifts in Arctic vegetation and associated feedbacks under climate change, massive greening in the Arctic over the next few decades. Below that, a paper just published last, uh, last week, uh, uh, in 2015, ground and satellite-based evidence of the biophysical mechanisms behind the greening Sahel, sub-Saharan Africa, Various remote sensing studies observed a positive trend in vegetative greenness known as the regreening of the Sahel. Below that, forest stand growth dynamics in Central Europe have, educate, have accelerated since 1870. On the right side, northern ecosystems, then the story about Russia and Belarus that I've already mentioned. Uh, below on the right, impact of CO2 fertilization on maximum foliage cover across the globe's warm, arid environments, places like Australia. Now, probably the most obvious reason is simply the increase of the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And of course, farmers pump CO2 into greenhouses to, to make plants grow better. Uh, CO2 is what many plants inhale to feel good. And it also enables plants to grow more while using the same or less water. So there's the CO2 itself, and Californians, uh, famous Californians, David Keeling and his son Ralph Keeling at Scripps Institution of Oceanography have kept superfine measurements of CO2 since 1958. And here you can see the increasing size of the, what's called the seasonal cycle of uh, CO2. On the top, the, year, the average for the years 1958 to 61. Uh, in, in black, and the larger oscillation in purple of, uh, of the average of 2009-11, and the, the same data charted in a different way below. And you can see that in the, in the recent period, there's a bigger amplitude of the fluctuation between the, uh, the uh, summer, when the, the uh, plants absorb, inhale the carbon dioxide, and the fall and winter, when it gets released. And the fact that this bigger breathing is going on is, reflects the, the, the increase in size of the biosphere, especially in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, as reported now in a whole series of papers. But this increase, it's a global phenomenon and potentially enlarging the biosphere in, in almost all regions. Now also in some areas, especially the high latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere, the growing, the growing season has lengthened, attributed to global warming. 
And whatever we may think about it, the longer growing season is also causing more plant growth, demonstrated uh, mo uh, most impressively and uh, convincingly in Finland. Some papers have come out very, with very detailed province-by-province -province study of Finland looking at detailed climate records, uh, the longer growing season, and showing more growth in Finland. And I mentioned sub-Saharan Africa, which may be connected with more rain. Now, there's also more nitrogen around in the biosphere these days, uh, and the more nitrogen here and there in the environment may also be contributing to the, the, the global greening. A group of us is now trying to dissect or attribute uh, let's say the two billion tons or whatever the right number is to longer growing seasons, to abandonment of agriculture, to nitrogen and so forth. It's gonna take some, some careful work uh, over, over the uh, coming couple of years. But in any case, the numbers are huge and the effect is global. And in this, this uh, slide shows a satellite comparison of the biosphere in 1982 and in 2011. And you can see 31% of the global vegetated area greened, 14% increase in gross productivity, and it's seen in all vegetation types and in the Amazon and West Africa and Central Africa and in India and China, uh, just everywhere. I, I would repeat that global greening is the most important ecological phenomenon on land today. Well, in speaking about land, I've occasionally mentioned materials such as nitrogen and water, and let me now suggest that in addition to peak farmland and peak timber, America may also be experiencing peak use of many other resources. Uh, back in the 1970s, we thought America's growing appetite might exhaust Earth's crust of just about every metal and mineral. But a surprising thing happened, even as our population kept growing. The intensity of use of the resources began to fall first, that is the amount we used per dollar, so to say. Uh, for each new dollar, we didn't use the same copper or steel that we had. Uh, and here you can see the change in, in uh, uh, not just the relative, but the absolute use of, 19, of nine basic commodities from 2000, 1900 to 2010. And it's easy to understand why in 1970 I was out there uh, 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 advocating for Earth Day. Uh, if you were in 1970 looking back, you saw everything going up. Uh, and if you were in the film The Graduate, you, you predicted that plastics would grow the most, and that's the red line growing at the, at the top. Uh, but you see that between 1970 and 1990, things began to flatten, and then about, uh, and actually peak. And so now you see plastics, paper, timber, phosphate, potash, lead, aluminum, steel, copper, in absolute use in the United States, all of them falling. Well, this reversal of use uh, surprised me and my colleagues so much that we started a detailed study of 100 commodities in the U.S. from 1900 to 2010, and 100 commodities span just about everything you can think of in the material world, from arsenic and asbestos to water and zinc. And, uh, of the 100, we found that only 30, that, excuse me, that 36 already have peaked in absolute use. Uh, here are eight shown, chromium, fluorospar, pig iron, iron ore, uh, uh, some nasty ones like uh, cadmium and asbestos, uh, good riddance to most of them. So again, you see uh, things rising up to 1970 or so, then uh, plateauing, then falling, and actually dropping way down uh, in the use of some of them. So 36 of the 100 are already falling. We found another 53 that appear to be plateauing and we think are likely to fall, uh, many of them, if not all of the 53. Uh, here you see, again, a, a, a subset of, uh, of eight. Uh, electricity at the top, which may also be plateauing. Then nickel, nitrogen, cement, uh, petroleum, which I'll return later, cobalt, cropland, and water, which I'll say more about. Uh, so these uh, appear near peak. Uh, we found only 11 commodities that are still growing in both relative and absolute use. Uh, and this shows eight of them and explains the title of our forthcoming report, which is Chickens and Gallium. Uh, and chickens, of course, are winning the meat war. Uh, uh, and most of the other elements that are growing are vitamins, like the gallium and indium, used to dope or alloy other bulk materials and make them smarter, or niobium, 
um, the uh, alien for birthday parties. Uh, it has other uses. Uh, but, but really, uh, one, in a sense, one, again, one can think that you know, it's, it's more information because what rhenium or gallium or indium does is it takes something, it's a vitamin, it takes something that's a bit dumb as a material and makes it much smarter by adding good properties. So what's the result of this? Well, it's uh, dematerialization. And dematerialization is no surprise, of course, to San Franciscans because you've caused it. You've made the devices that replace the big old clumsy hunks of metal and blobs of plastic pictured on the right of the figure. So enormous numbers of devices that used to use lots of uh, materials uh, are largely becoming obsolete and replaced by, by, by more compact systems. Well, an astonishing thing is that uh, uh, water, uh, you know, and I think even California's economizing on water during this drought of the last three or four years may be surprised to see what's happened to water withdrawals in America since 1970. This figure first shows in the straight lines that the uh, expert projections made in the 1970s of water use, what water use to the year 2000 would be. And the magenta segments, uh, show what actually happened. So instead of rising, uh, water use was flat while America added 80 million people. We added the population of Turkey to the United States and water use stayed flat. And in fact, as this slide mentions and as this slide shows, uh, water use through 2010, which is the latest set of data, uh, has, a has actually now declined to levels below 1970. Uh, this is data just released by the U.S. Geological Survey. And as the figure notes, uh, production of corn has tripled while this has gone on. And the largest reasons are more efficient water use in farming and also more efficient use in power generation. Well, in the land of Lyft and Uber, uh, I, I must speak about petroleum and mobility too. And this figure shows uh, per capita petroleum use rising into a 1970 Plymouth Roadrunner. I hope at least one person here had one. Uh, uh, and most experts worried about uh, further rises, uh, but this is what actually happened to per, cap per capita apparent consumption in the US, uh, a plateau and then fall. And partly vehicles have become more efficient, but also partly travel and personal vehicles seems to have saturated. Uh, this is a figure that's a little harder to read. It's from the Federal Highway Administration. Uh, but in blue, you see annual vehicle distance uh, traveled for personal vehicles in billions of miles. And you can see that for about 10 years, it's been flat. So even before the dro little drop comes in 2008 with the Great Recession, one can ask whether we're at peak vehicle miles in personal, vehicle, uh, personal vehicles. The, uh, the green line shows the year-to-year, year-on-year change in vehicle miles traveled. And on the left, in 1971, at the start, it was growing by 6%. And on the right, it's uh, fluctuating around zero. Uh, well, uh, so we may be at peak car travel. Now, if you buy an extra car, it's probably for fashion or flexibility. You won't spend more minutes per day driving or drive more miles. And unlike the car companies, I would not bet on selling a lot more cars either. Uh, this figure fits a curve smoothly to the population of cars in the USA, and we seem to be near peak car, and some uh, comparable studies in the UK uh, suggest the same thing there. Now, the reason, of course, may be that drone taxis are winning. The average personal vehicle motors about an hour per day. But a, a shared car, like a zip car, is used, let's say, eight hours a day, and a taxi even more. Uh, as venture capitalists here know, driverless cars can work tirelessly and safely and accomplish the present mileage with many fewer vehicles. The manufacturers won't like it, but markets do simply fade away, as for typewriters and newsprint. And moreover, new forms of transport can enter the game. According to our studies, the best bet is on magnetically levitated systems, or maglevs, trains, 
with magnetic suspension and propulsion. Uh, Elon Musk has proposed a variant he calls the Hyperloop that would speed between Los Angeles and San Francisco at about 1,000 kilometers an hour, 600 miles an hour, accomplishing the trip in about 35 minutes and thus comfortably allowing daily round trips, very important if the local arrangements are also quick. Now, the maglev is a vehicle without wings, wheels, and motor, and thus without combustibles aboard, safe, and it's suspended ma magnetically between two guardrails, which resemble an open stator of an electric motor, and it can be either pushed, propelled by a magnetic field, or pulled that uh, by a field that runs in front. And the uh, hard limits to the possible speed of maglevs don't really exist. In a sense, they're more like aircraft. And if they run in evacuated tunnels, as a number of us have advocated for some years, and as Musk has also proposed, uh, they can go very, very fast. Evacuated means simulating, let's say, the atmosphere at 30,000 feet, the low pressure that an airplane uh, encounters. And these can be in tunnels that would solve the problem of landscape disturbance, uh, or they could be in tubes mounted uh, above existing rights of way of roads or rails, which might prove easier and cheaper to build. It's important to note that they're spared a motor, and they're also spared the belly fat called fuel. You know, a, a goose and an airplane are really the same thing. You have, you have, uh, you have uh, kerosene in the belly of the aircraft, and you have goose fat in the belly of the goose, they fly, and after they've flown across the Atlantic, they've burned up their fuel. Uh, well, uh, belly fat is its weight, and the maglev could break, break something we call the rule of the ton, the, uh, which is burden mobility. The weight of a horse and its gear, a train per passenger, and an auto, which on average carries a little more than one passenger, or a jumbo jet at takeoff with all its fuel, all average about one ton of vehicle per passenger. But a maglev could slim to, let's say, 300 kilos, a third or less. And of course, if you have much lighter vehicles, then immediately you drop drastically the cost of energy transport. So the maglevs uh, could solve this problem that transport engineers have not been able to solve. Now, you can ask, will maglevs make us sprawl? And it's a legitimate fear. Uh, cars did it. Uh, but in contrast to the car, you can think of maglevs as offering the alternative of a bimodal or virtual city with pedestrian islands and fast connections between them. The maglevs could function as national and continental scale metros at jet speed. And this being San Francisco, I, I'll look farther into the, and the long now, I'll look farther into the 21st century, and we can imagine a system that's really, a maglev system that would really be quite wondrous, I mean, the, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, in the same way that the maker of the Stutz Bearcat probably couldn't have imagined the freeway system, but, but think of the maglev system as a set of magnetic bubbles moving under the control of a, a central computer, and what we put inside the bubbles is immaterial. It could be uh, a, a personal or small collective vehicle, starting, for example, as an elevator in a skyscraper, coming down, becoming a taxi in the maglev uh, network, and then again becoming an elevator in another uh, skyscraper. So you could have this entire sort of bazaar of maglev bubbles run like a video game, where shuffling and rerouting would lead the vehicle to its destination swiftly, following the model of the internet. In the end, the maglev system is a common carrier or highway, meaning private as well as mass vehicles can shoot through it. So over the course of century, the century, that can be built. And among other things, this would mean that the city air will be even cleaner uh, if the source of electricity is clean. Maglevs are uh, it's an electrical system. And, but in fact, Americans have been doing a pretty good job of also of decoupling growth and air quality. Uh, uh, and we, we can see that it's not just decoupling, but in fact, we've experienced absolute falls in pollution. Uh, here you see emissions of sulfur dioxide, a classic air pollutant, which peaked about 1970 uh, because of a blend of factors, including better technology and stronger regulation. Uh, the, uh, uh, and the arc of this sulfur dioxide forms a classic curve in which uh, pollution first grows as people get a bit richer and then falls as Americans grew richer still and preferred clean air. The, uh, so th that's one of the real successes. Uh, what about carbon dioxide? I think we also have probably experienced peak carbon dioxide emissions in the U.S. Uh, uh, 
this figure, the, the chart, the data, only goes through 2007. That was the peak year of emissions from energy for the U.S. Uh, and now, since 2007, uh, in 2013, the emissions were about 10 percent below 2007. The 2014 data aren't out yet. We may, you know, now with the falling oil prices, things may plateau for a while again. But I think the basic idea, the basic idea is, is clear, that we're, we're uh, uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, you know it's a it's a story repeated in many ways, and I would say these trajectories for for the sulfur dioxide or for the carbon emissions is important to me. I think they're preset, not created by public policy or politicians. As the German politician Bismarck said in a speech in 1895, a statesman does not create the stream; he floats on it and tries to steer. In California terms, the best politicians are surfers, winning attention for wide riding waves. Uh, the, uh, now, I've spoken about farms, uh, forests, materials, including water and mobility, and let me report very briefly on human population as well. The U.S. fertility rate declined six years in a row, beginning in 2008. It's now at 1.86 below the, the per woman below the uh, the famous replacement level of 2.1. Now, immigration will, keep, will continue to keep the U.S. population growing, but globally it appears that Earth is passing peak child. A Swedish statistician and physician Hans Rosling, who many of you know for, may know from his famous Gapminder talk on TED Talk, estimates that the absolute number of humans born reached about 130 million in 1990 and has stayed around that number since then. And with declining fertility all over the world, which you see here, uh, including the world in the purple, down to the replacement level of 2.1, the number of newcomers should soon fall. Now, while momentum, younger people, and greater longevity of the people who are here, people born today are expected to live in the US are expected to live between 108 and 112, so the long now matters. Or, the, the children, or the, 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 the young children of people in this room will be a lot, could be, well be alive in the year 2120. Um, uh, but with, with the s slow growth in population, or no growth, technical progress can counter the likely mouths. It's very simple. If you have a 2% per year gain in efficiency, which is something engineers can certainly do, that can dominate a growth of population of 1% or even less. Well. If only everything were trending in the right direction, uh, some of my oceans colleagues are here, and I explore and observe the oceans a lot, and ocean life is getting a raw deal still. Uh, let's think a little bit about the form of meat called fish. Uh, consider the change in the catch of a charter boat out of Key West between 1958 and 2007. Uh, you can see there were no more large groupers in 2007, the same charter boat. Or take a trip to the Tokyo fish market. Uh, sea life is astonishingly, astonishingly delicious and tastier and more varied in markets than ever, owing to improved storage and transport. So an octopus from Mauritania, as in this uh, photo, ends in Japan. Now, before the advent of refrigeration, fresh sushi was a delicacy for the emperor of Japan. Uh, in uh, 2001, a 489-pound bluefin sold for $1.76 million in Tokyo. And we may say that the democratization of sushi has changed everything for sea life. And here are a few slides of the, from 2000, this was the 2011 auction in, uh, in uh, Tokyo, you see the bluefin. Uh, here I mentioned the, the peak at the auction. Uh, carried away, butchered red meat. Um, well, uh, the, uh, you can just see that the, uh, the story for marine life, let's say it's 100 years behind the land. Fish biomass in intensively exploited fisheries appears to be about one-tenth the level of the fish in those areas a few decades or 100 years ago. Uh, for example, the total estimated 
kilos of cod off Cape Cod. Uh, today, probably weigh, in fact, only about 3% of the, all the cod in 1815. The average swordfish harpooned off New England dropped in size from about 500 pounds in 1860 to about 200 pounds already in 1930. And of course, most of the swordfish sold now in New England come from the South Atlantic. To survive wild in the ocean, an unprotected species needs to enjoy juvenile sex and spawn before capture. You have to live fast and die young. Well, earlier we spoke about land meat and how does world consumption of fish that depletes the ocean compare to the 800 million tons or so of animal products that humanity eats. Fish meat is about one-fifth of land meat. Uh, in 2012, about 90 million tons of fish were taken wild from salt and fresh water, about 80 million from salt and about 10 million from fresh, and a fast-growing 66 million tons from fish farms and ranches. Now, Americans, in fact, eat little sea life, about seven kilos per person per year, but much of that is from the wild schools of the sea, and that even though that's small globally, it depletes the oceans, because there are 320 million of us. But the ancient sparing of land animals by farming shows us how to spare the fish in the sea. If we want to eat sea life, we need to raise the share we farm and lower the share we catch. Fish farming doesn't require invention. It's been around for a long time. The Chinese have been doing it very nicely, raising herbivores such as carp for centuries. And following the Chinese example, one feeds crops grown on land by farmers to herbivorous fish in ponds. And much, much aquaculture of catfish in, near the Gulf of Mexico or of carp and tilapia in Southeast Asia and the Philippines takes this form. The fish grown in the ponds spare fish from the ocean. And like poultry, fish convert protein in feed to protein in meat. And because the fish do not have to stand up at all, the water supports them, uh, they convert calories to feed into meat even more efficiently than poultry, let's say 80 miles per gallon rather than 60 or 40. Well, all the improvements such as breeding and disease control that have made poultry production more efficient can, can be and have been applied to aquaculture, improving the conversion of feed to meat and sparing wild fish. Now, in some fish ranching, I'll call it, notably most of today's ranching of salmon, the salmon effectively graze the oceans as the razorback hogs of a primitive farmer graze the oak woods. Such aquaculture consists of catching small wild fish, such as menhaden, anchovies, and sardines, or their oil, and feeding them to our herds, such as the salmon in pens. We change the form of the fish from, from menhaden to salmon, but we, we add economic value, but we don't change the stocks. In fact, we may reduce them. Well, we need a shift from ocean ranching to true farming that will spare the depletion, and that's one way to do it, or we can try to persuade salmon and other carnivores to eat tofu. <laughs> and in fact, this should happen very soon. Cobia, sometimes called kingfish, uh, widespread in the Caribbean and other warm waters, grows up to two meters, big fish, 80 kilos, and they, their favorite diet is crab, squid, and smaller fish. Well, recently Aaron Watson and other researchers at the University of Maryland have turned this carnivore into a vegetarian. Uh, they have a mixture of plant-based proteins, fatty acids, and an amino acid substance very much like the one in energy, energy drinks that your children favor. And it pleases the cobia as well as bream. And conversion of these carnivorous fish to completely vegetarian diet breaks the cycle in which fish, fish ranchers plunder the ocean's small fish uh, to provide the feed for the big fish. And you can see in the top right of this chart, in the, the dark blue, this is a chart from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the FAO, that all the growth of, uh, uh, of fish meat since uh, about 1985-1990 has been through aquaculture. The, uh, uh, we are at peak fish, not for good reasons, from the capture production. So uh, if we want more, we need to uh, 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 we need to, to, to go to aquaculture, and it can't, it's not just fish. We can do the same for the filter feeders, the oysters, clams, and mussels. We have to take care for effluents, uh, pathogens, and other concerns. 
Now, eventually, we might grow fish not in the oceans at all, but in closed silos at high density, feeding them proteins made by microorganisms grown on hydrogen, nitrogen, and carbon. And the fish could be sturgeon filled with caviar. And in fact, much of the caviar now sold in Moscow is raised in fish farms in the Po Valley in northern Italy. Uh, there's not much wild sturgeon left in the Volga. Uh, well, the point is that the high levels of harvest of wild fishes and destruction of marine habitat to capture them need not continue. And the 40% of seafood in the dark blue in the chart already raised by aquaculture signals the potential for reversal. With smart aquaculture, life in the oceans can rebound while feeding humanity and restoring nature. Now, because California, at least Northern California, is the world capital of experimentation in cuisine, let me offer uh, an alternative, more radical uh, idea than vegetarian salmon. Uh, we can understand that in a world of, of 7 billion human mouths, aquaculture must largely replace hunting of the wild animals for many, maybe all forms of marine life, and we're accustomed to the reality that even vast America does not produce enough wild ducks or wild blueberries to satisfy our appetite. But back to basics. We depend on the hydrogen produced by the chlorophyll of plants, and as my colleague Marchetti has pointed out, once you have hydrogen produced, for example, by means of nuclear energy, a plethora of microorganisms are cap capable of cooking it into the variety of, of substances in our kitchens. And researchers in the space programs, uh, in fact, for decades, have been producing food conceived for astronauts on the way to Mars by cult cultivating hydrogen ammonas on a diet of hydrogen, carbon dioxide, and a little oxygen. And they make proteins that taste a little bit like hazelnut. Now, a person consumes about 100 watts. Uh, the Diablo Canyon Nuclear Power Park operates two 1,100 megawatt electric power plants on about 900 acres, or 1.5 square miles. And the power of Diablo Canyon, a couple of gigawatts, therefore, could supply food for a few million people, more than 2,000 per acre, more than 10 times what David Hula or Randy Dowdy achieve with corn. You could imagine a single spherical fermenter of about 100 yards in diameter producing the primary food for the 30 million inhabitants of Mexico City. The foods would, of course, be formatted before arriving at the consumer. You may be grimacing, but observe that our most sophisticated foods, like cheeses and wines, are the product of sophisticated elaboration by microorganisms of simple feedstocks such as milk and grape juice. So the, the, the microorganisms as chefs shouldn't be underestimated. Well, globally, uh, a, a food system like this could allow humanity to release 90% of the land and sea now exploited for food. Now, in Petaluma and Eureka, humanity might maintain artisanal farming and fishing to provide supreme flavorings for the bulk tofu. Well, I don't expect 90% to, to be spared, but I do think humanity is moving toward landless agriculture or progressively using less land for food, and that we should aim to release for nature an area the size of India by 2050. Overall, I think the next decades present an enormous opportunity for what Stuart and Ryan call revive and restore. People will object that I've spoken little about China and India and Africa, but I respond with a remark of Gertrude Stein, who came from nearby Oakland. Stein said about 1930 that America is the oldest country in the world because America has been in the 20th century longer than, an, than any other country. In fact, as early as 1873, America became the world's largest economy, and since then, a disproportionate share of the products and habits that diffuse throughout the world have come from America, particularly California. My view is that the patterns described are not exceptional to the US, and that within a few decades, the same patterns, in fact, already evident in Europe and Japan, will be evident in many more places. Now, rebound is not without challenges. We considered the black bear and the college student to begin. Later in the Long Now seminar series, you'll discuss the challenges of a woolly mammoth. 
but consider the fox. Fox experts now that estimate that about 10,000 foxes roam the city of London. <laughs> More than the double-decker buses. As you can see, foxes ride the London Underground for free. <laughs> the mayor of London, Boris Johnson, became enraged when his cat appeared to be mauled by a fox, which was accused of being a fair beater as well. And English snipers, uh, in fact, charge $120 to shoot a fox in your, in your city garden. But, and meanwhile, in rural England, Badgers are causing an uncivil war between farmers and animal protection groups. And you know more about bobcats in California than I. So we have a new round of what journalist Jim Sturba has chronicled in a great book called Nature Wars, the incredible story of how wildlife comebacks turned backyards into battlegrounds. But I, I want to end not with complications, but with inspiration, with examples of why we want rebound, rewilding, why we want a rapprochement with nature, why the achievement of farmers David Hula and Randy Dowdy and aquaculturist Aaron Watson and their counterparts in forestry and water and materials matter. The incipient rewilding of Europe that Stuart mentioned is thrilling. Salmon have returned to the Rhine and to the Seine. Lynx have returned to several countries. Wolves have returned to Italy. Reindeer herds have rebounded in Scandinavia. I mentioned Eastern Europe a couple of times. Enjoy these photographs of bison that have returned to Poland. These and the preceding photos come from a new film about rewilding, the seasons, from the French filmmaker and producer Jacques Perrin, uh, who made the film's winged migration about long-distance migration of birds and microcosmos about insects. The seasons is scheduled for release in December 2016. My final still image, which was on the first slide as well, comes not from Europe, but from the entrance to New York Harbor. I propose this image of a humpback whale with the Empire State Building in the background is the most significant environmental, American environmental image of 2014. Humpback whales and other cetaceans, perhaps even blue whales, are returning in large numbers to New York Bight. Recall the whale despair of the 1970s and consider that the Bronx Zoo has just announced a program together with the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution to monitor whale numbers and movements in sight of New York City. Many decades without hunting and improved Hudson River water quality have made a difference. Thank you. Shall we have a seat? Please. Jesse, you, hey. You know, you remind me more of Buckminster Fuller than anybody I've met in a long time. He used to talk about ephemeralization, doing more with less, and you've got dematerialization, and you throw all those numbers out there, and people get excited. Nobody else makes people excited about numbers the way you do. Um, you've had a leadership role in the census of marine life. Um, would you report a little bit on what came out of that? Yes, uh, in the late 1990s, a uh, uh, group of people interested in marine life all around the world decided that for the first time we should have a census. We should try to provide information on diversity, distribution, and abundance. How many forms of life uh, there are in the ocean, where they live, their addresses, their ranges, and abundance, how many kilos or pounds of, of the different forms. And from 2000 to 2010, we in fact were able to conduct the, the census. There were 540 expeditions, about 3,000 people participated from 80 countries. And uh, the good news is we discovered 6,000 new species. We made new estimates of the total forms of life in the ocean. We made the first comprehensive list of all the known forms. We estimated that there are a million or more forms of life still to be discovered in the ocean, so there are still naming opportunities. Uh, 
We discovered all kinds of blue highways where the animals travel and lots of new information about the ranges. So I'd say with regard to diversity and distribution, there was a lot of, one might say, good news. On the abundance side, as you saw with the slide of the, the, the recreational uh, charter boat in Key West, uh, we found very disturbing news. Basically, most of the species that have entered human commerce have plummeted in quantity, not gone extinct. Extinction is very unusual in the oceans because they're so large. There are usually a few left, but huge drops in population. And the, there are, of course, great questions now about whether the total biomass in the ocean has changed, you know, have jellies or, or squids or others grown in number to compensate for the, the losses of the cod and the others. So, but at least there is a baseline for the first time, uh, and we hope in 2020 or 2025 the world may conduct a second census and begin to put in place a global ocean observing system that can go from the snapshot to a video or a movie and re uh, report in a timely way to us the changes, uh, good and bad, that are occurring. So one of the, the things that the environmental movement really focused on in the 1970s was saving the whales. And uh, you know, policy changed, and, and uh, not just through standard oil, but through um, you know, stopping the hunting of the whales, except for a few still by Japan. Which, you know, those are big, slowly reproducing mammals. Um, how long does it take them to get back, or are they already back to what they were uh, before? Some populations of whales uh, have regrown well. Here on the west coast, uh, there have been some very encouraging estimates, uh, even about the blue whales, that the number of blue whales, I think, is now back up also to about 3,000 uh, mm -hmm. estimated all up and down the coast from numbers in you know, perhaps 300 or 400. Uh, so I, I, you know, with, with the animals that wait, you know, wait till they're teenagers to, to have sex, uh, you, know, you, have, you have to be very patient. Uh, with animals like uh, squid that can grow very fast and and have very short life cycles, uh, the recovery can be much, much quicker. But some of us have talked about the idea of having a, just a global moratorium on uh, uh, disturbing sea life. World War II was the best thing that happened in the 20th century to marine life. Basically, for five years, there was much, much less fishing. And in 1946, both in the Atlantic and the Pacific, there were a lot more animals than there were in 1939. And uh, so we know if you leave things alone, uh, uh, the, the, especially the larger animals will grow back. And maybe we need a, uh, maybe we need a decade or, of peace with the oceans or a generation to allow a very substantial regrowth. And as I said in my remarks, I think, uh, we, we ha I think humanity has to cut back on, its, uh, on, on the capture of wild fish and the consumption of wild fish. If we, want, if we want fish meat, we, we need to move to, to uh, aquaculture. So a version of that is presumably these protected areas, which are suddenly multiplying rapidly. Um, is, is that a... Do, <laughs> do the fish know to go there and reproduce? <laughs> well, the, the marine there are many forms... Of, uh, marine life, there are many ways of making a living in the ocean. So you have completely sessile creatures that stay mm -hmm. seated, like a barnacle. Uh, and then you have animals like tuna that may swim between Los Angeles and, uh, and Tokyo or Yokohama in a few months. So one has to have strategies for the sessile species and these highly mobile species mm -hmm. and, uh, and everything in between. The marine protected areas are most important for the species that are sessile or have small ranges. It's possible for tuna, though, to have areas, you know, the, the tunas breed at certain times of the year in certain places like the northern Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. So it's also possible to put in transient or ephemeral protection where you say, you know, for these 60 days or 90 days you should uh, uh, leave a particular area alone. So, you know, I, I think there are reasonable strategies. Uh, now, there are Removal, direct removal, eating is still the biggest problem for marine life, but of course, destruction of habitat, pollution coming out of rivers, uh, you know, there are, there are other, other problems as well, and those need, to be, those need to be addressed in their ways. Do you eat fish? I eat very little sea life. Uh, I don't use the term seafood unless, except in a very narrow way. Uh, 
Uh, I regard most forms of life in, my ocean, in the ocean as my friends, and I don't, I, I've stopped enjoying eating, eating uh, sea life for the most part. There are some exceptions, but uh, uh, I eat very little sea life. I don't feel that way about chickens, though. <laughs> Uh, Chelsea Saunter asks, how are biodiversity hotspots addressed in your studies? For example, Indonesian forests and palm versus uh, you know, keeping orangutans and so on. Well, Indonesia is the most tragic location on Earth now for people concerned about losses. You know, at any given, it's like births and deaths at any given time. You know, there's always going to be a net. There, there, you know, things are growing and things are being cut in various places. And the, if, you, if you look at the negative side of the ledger, uh, Indonesia, even more than Brazil, is the place uh, where the, the, the losses uh, of forest and the animals uh, that live in the forests and so forth is, uh, is most heartbreaking. In those areas, I think one needs, a very, one needs uh, very specific kinds of action to try to stop those, those losses. Now, what I've described mostly is a global, a set of global trends, and th those, what's happening globally doesn't uh, necessarily describe what's happening in, uh, uh, in Sausalito or in any particular place. So what always has to be careful, the global generalization, no, they're true globally, but there'll always be places where, uh, where one needs other strategies. Now, hotspots and protected areas, uh, the in the, 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 only, the first marine protected area in the world was created in La Jolla Cove in the early 1970s, the very first, you know, almost 100 years after the first national parks in the U.S. and elsewhere. So as, as I, in, in many ways, the oceans are 100 years behind the land. Mm. So we have less experience in how to protect the oceans, and we've protected much less of it. I think on land, in the various forms of protection that exist in one place or another and have now existed for many decades, you know, in the case of Yellowstone or Yosemite and so forth, the, I think we, the, the vocabulary, the toolkit is pretty good on land, and I think people have a pretty good sense of what works. Now, it's important to say that, as I suggested with Jeff, Be the e-readers, Kindles mm -hmm. and so forth, solutions sometimes come from unexpected places. Uh, you know, as some of the people concerned uh, with, uh, with uh, conservation of, uh, of uh, uh, tigers and rhinos will tell you, one of the solutions is little blue pills, Viagra. Uh, tiger bone and rhino horn, in fact, do not cure erectile dysfunction, but Viagra and Cialis <laughs> do. And some people have said you should just give away little blue pills in Chinese markets and uh, you know, take, destroy the market for, the, for the, the tiger bone and rhino horn. And I think those kinds of ideas need to be taken very seriously. And again, the, the, uh, you, you, it, one shouldn't think of conservation or conservationists only as the people who you know, lobby for conservation in very traditional ways. The, again, the, 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 these, it, the, you know, if you look at forests or, or food or any of these things or materials, you know, the dematerialization, all of this didn't come because the environmental groups of which you know many of them I you know I, I donate and so forth, but they were they none of them in the 70s or 80s said we need a program on dematerialization and we need mm -hmm. to get rid of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, vacuum tube TVs and you know they, they, you know you can look back through everything they didn't even think about it so so solutions can come from you know from unexpected places and I think we have to keep our ears and eyes open for that. One other question on seafood. Tim K. asks, why do seafood sustainability guides encourage wild-caught fish and shun farmed food, for example, salmon? Well, uh, aquaculture, like any industry, like the, whatever, the private carting industry or, uh, uh, or plumbers or electricians uh, or jazz musicians, uh, there, there are people who are good at it and people who are not so good at it. And it's a young industry, and I think there have been quite a few people who were sloppy or careless when needs monitoring and regulation. Uh, so I think part of the, part of the uh, negativity in some quarters about aquaculture has to do with bad practices in a young industry. Part of it has to do with a romantic idea that uh, 
somehow something wild is better than something uh, farmed. That, but the problem is in a world of 7.3 billion people and even more, and a billion people now eat sushi. So you just, the things that, you know, if, if only you or I went out of, you know, went and caught a few fish, uh, salmon mm -hmm. from the Klamath River or whatever, it might be okay, but it just doesn't work. A, a lot of these, so I, you know, I think there's, I think the people who are uh, uh, promoting uh, wild, eating wild sea life on more than a very, as more than a treat for the rich are just, uh, it's just, it's just a very dangerous idea. It can't be, it can't work in a world with a lot of prosperous people. Here's a question basically relating to efficiency and the concentration from John uh, Sanfilippo. Great efficiency leads to great vulnerability. Monocrops, concentration may bring disease, crop failure, etc. This is a question of political and economic concentration versus democracy. What are the, what, what are the vulnerabilities of this kind of efficiency and concentration? Well, certainly, as I showed, the, you know, the Tower of Corn, you know, we, uh, uh, if bad things were ha to happen to corn, it could really be uh, 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 catastrophic. Uh, the, you know, I think one always needs lots of research. One needs very good monitoring uh, of, of uh, a range of things, weather, insects, and so forth. I don't think, I, I think there's an arrogance in uh, much of the world, uh, at least much of the developed world, places like America, about Farmers, people think farmers are dumb uh, <laughs> because we don't do it anymore. In fact, farming is as successful as telecommunications and computer science and all the things that go on out here, as I tried to show. The, you know, the, 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 what farmers have accomplished, one can say in 10,000 years, but just in the last 50 or 60 years is almost beyond belief in terms of the calories and protein. So. I think we have to be very careful not to think these people are stupid or incompetent or lazy. They're very, very good at what they do. In the same way that that uh, companies operating the telecommunication system are, at the same time, one always has to take some attention to catastrophic failure. You know, whether it's uh, whether it's with regard to water systems or or food systems or electric power, uh, uh, and so there there are always. You know, any big system uh, uh, has uh, has vulnerabilities. At the same time, I think the, there's a real misunderstanding about world agriculture. The problem in world agriculture is not shortages. The problem is this incredible success has led to this obesity, too much meat eating, uh, a third of the food being wasted, and much more land being used than needs to be. So. You know, people who worry that, whatever, climate change will reduce agricultural production by 18% in 2050. My view is we could reduce agricultural production by 50% right now and actually have a better world. Uh, now, the, that's not to say the income of farmers should go down. I, okay. I'm happy, you know, to, to you know, if, 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 to, to pay people to, do ver to produce what's needed and to pay them very well. But, but the idea that, you know, that, you know, if, I mean, the, the, the problem is there's, you know, it, that's, you know, it's all turning into vodka and bourbon and, uh, and God knows what, you know, the, the, who knows what the productivity of hemp farming will turn into. So, it's coming uh, fast, apparently. Uh, not just for dope. Um, well, one, uh, one more question on that, uh, the crops. Uh, Julian asks, how much of crop yield improvement is affected by genetic engineering? Is what is the effect of that in the long term for humanity and uh, for the environment as a whole? Higher yields are the result of uh, a, a set of uh, a, 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 a cluster of, uh, of innovations. Uh, uh, a simple one, which is actually extremely important and part of the way the high yields were achieved by Randy Dowdy and David Hula, is uh, plant spacing is much closer than it used to be. Uh, there were traditional ideas about how closely you could plant Hmm. Uh, uh, it also had to do with the way people worked in fields. So there are more plants per square meter, per, per square yard. Uh, then there have been changes in seeds. Uh, 
improved weather forecasts, uh, uh, better forms of, of, of uh, irrigation, uh, uh, fertilizers of various kinds, herbicides, pesticides. Uh, so there's a range of innovations which have been used. But, what, what the, uh, but the, the real growth, the real, the improvements in yield, as I showed, I mean, it's just, as it's just the data. In the last 20 years, yields of potatoes or of corn have kept going like that, while the inputs of fertilizer and so forth have been flat or even falling. Is that because so, of cost or because of environmental worries? Well, the, I, I think it's more like, I think part of it was an over-enthusiasm when these things were new, mm. and it's also self-medication. You know, if you go to the doctor and they give you, they say, take some of these pills, antibiotics, the doctor says take, you know, whatever, one every four hours. A lot of people take two, uh, or if you, you know, you think two aspirin will get rid of a headache, all the people take four. And I think the, a lot of people thought, well, this more fertilizer is good. I mean, they, uh, fertilizer is good, I'll put more fertilizer on. And the fertilizer salesman, of course, didn't, uh, <laughs> abuse them of that notion. And I think, so there was a kind of overshoot in mm -hmm. use of inputs, um, but the, the real input that ma that's mattering is information. It's better weather forecasts, when to do things. Now, one can consider uh, uh, genetics one form of information. So it's it's a uh, you know, it's, 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 it's another form of information. It's a more precise one. Crop breeding has existed for 10,000 years, and as many people will say to you, from, uh, genetic modification started with agriculture. Mm -hmm. So people may object to specific kinds of, uh, of uh, genetic modification now. It seems a little curious to me because, you know, when you go to a hospital in San Francisco, people, you know, we accept now all kinds of things on ourselves and our children. Uh, in the way of genetic modification and genetic treatments and gene therapy that we don't want to do to corn. So it's, some of it <laughs> seems to me a little peculiar, but, but, uh, but as with everything, I, I would always stress you need to monitor and watch for, you know, people can make mistakes, things can go wrong, it's impossible to, to anticipate every eventuality. So, you know, in the, in the new forms, the evolving forms of agriculture, it's still very, very important to to put in lots of sensors and watch things, and you know things can go wrong and do go wrong. So, uh, uh, but but I, I think the uh, but but it's it's uh, precision. Uh, we we in our work we we never use the word intensification because intensification gives the incorrect, the untrue image that uh, hmm. rising production and yields <clears throat> in America and uh, other countries number of other countries in the last 20 years have come from this idea of, you know, you're pouring more stuff on, on your acre. Mm -hmm. And that's not what's been happening. In fact, in many cases, people have been, the applications have been lower, mm -hmm. but smarter. You've mentioned climate change just in passing a couple of times, once where it might affect uh, success of agriculture, once where the biosphere seems to be responding to longer growing seasons and more CO2, which plants like. Um, you were one of the first half dozen people in America to look at climate change seriously. In fact, you told me last night that when you first proposed studying that to, I guess, your supervisor at Columbia, they said it's not a subject. That's correct. That was 1980, 81. 1981. Climate change. I was told it was not a subject. It was not a subject for a doctoral dissertation. It I has left. become a subject for doctoral <laughs> dissertations, I've noticed. <laughs> Quite a few of them. Uh, there's a lot of money there. Um, so you've tracked it in a way more from the beginning than most people. What's your sort of current thinking and frame, and uh, what do you think about climate change these days? Jesse? Well, uh, first I would say in, in, almost anything can be true about climate change in the sense that the, <laughs> the uh, well that covers a lot well uh, <laughs> first there's the question of what emissions will be in the future now as you can see I personally think that the economy is decarbonizing and evolving away at least at least the American but I, I think soon China and India too hmm. uh, so I, I'm, I I personally don't think that the emission you know the the projections of high future concentrations I think are as with the high future use of water, I, I don't think that's what's going to happen. Nevertheless, reasonable people can disagree. So some people may think, 
will go to 450 or 500 parts per million, and some people can think we'll go to 900. Then in turn, there's the question of how much the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, whatever, that go into the atmosphere, how much of those will stay in the atmosphere, how much will be absorbed by the land, how much will go into the ocean. And let's say that can be between one-third and two-thirds. So is the growing biosphere sucking down more CO2? Yes, it is. Yeah. How about in the oceans? Some of it is going into the oceans, yes. A lot of it is going into the land. So there's yeah. primary production of algae or whatever in the oceans are sucking this stuff down and returning it, or does it go to the bottom of the sea? Uh, no, most of it would sink, but the there haven't been. I mean, we tried to do some of this in the sense of marine life. There have been there have there are just two or three papers about whether primary productivity in the oceans, the, the meadows of the ocean, mm -hmm. are growing more the way that the meadows on land are now growing more. And uh, it's really, I would say, the evidence. There isn't enough evidence really to draw, to draw strong conclusions yet. Uh, the uh, Plankton in the oceans, of course, do, you know, if they're photosynthesis, if they're chlorophyll-based, you know, if they're sort of green plants, so to say, like plants on, on the land, they'll use the CO2. Other, plant, other animals and plants in the ocean could grow less. But let, let me just say, I think the, the point about climate change, then you have these different simulation models, some of which are, show a lot of climate change and some of which very little, and then you have the question of what will happen to agriculture, and then will the societies be like Malawi or Switzerland? So basically, you know, you can, you can have, you know, if you think emissions will be pretty low and the re part retained in the atmosphere will be pretty low and the sensitivity is, let's say, one and a half degrees, not three, then, you know, if, you, if you're, then you can have a scenario in which it really doesn't look like a terribly serious problem. On the other hand, if you take the high end five times, then, you know, it's the end of the world. So, so you have this huge spectrum, and so my feeling is everybody is right. It's kind of a la carte. You can take your, you know, it really depends on how risk averse and how you are to begin with, I would say, in terms of sort of where you, which results pop out at you. Well, it's an interestingly... And no one knows what's going to happen. That's the basic point. Um, but you have to, I mean, the question, what society chooses to do depends, again, it's a choice of how risk averse we are. Something terrible could happen, uh -huh. and therefore some people, when you say, you know, some people have a lot of insurance on their lives or their homes, some people wear bicycle helmets, some don't, some use seat belts, some don't. So, so the, you know, the, at the, in the end, it's really, for all the science that goes on, the real question is how risk averse societies are. And that, so how, you know, do you want to spend 1% or 3% or 5% or of your wealth or income because mm -hmm. something terrible could, could happen. Okay. Um, Kevin Kelly asks, I think probably a question that's occurring to many here, why are common perceptions so out of whack with the facts that you present here tonight? Well, uh, you know, I, I showed early that chart of the world up to 1970 and 1990 and then 2010. And I, I think the view of uh, destruction of, uh, of Earth that many people had in 1970, in fact, reflected a lot of what had gone on uh, in the century up until then. Mm -hmm. And uh, that created a kind of uh, view which, is, which spread and is repeated and widely held. And I think a lot of people just haven't continued to look at the actual data. So, you know, when you actually look, you know, then you see that whether it's America or Europe or the world, then you see that a lot of things that were projected to go like this have gone like this and even like this. Mm -hmm. And I, I but I, I think people are sort of still stuck living on the tangent of, of uh, 1970 or 1980. Well, there's an argument that um, that kind of dread or fear or panic or, or uh, deep concern um, that got sort of instilled in the 70s is uh, productive and good because that brings money and attention and science and saves the whales and uh, why would we uh, encourage people to relax? I, I, I wouldn't say, you know, I, I think one has to, you know, uh, you know, I'm not encouraging people to eat Tuna. So, I, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't. It's you know. I I, I think it's uh, first. I think uh, it's important also to share that 
some of the things we've done, whether it's Kindles and e-readers, or uh, laws banning use of asbestos and arsenic, that some of these things have worked. So to me, that's, that's, uh, that doesn't discourage future action. That makes people feel that the, 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 the things they've done, either as manufacturers or as, as households and consumers or uh, through public life, that, that they've had some effect. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I, if, if everything we had done for the last uh, uh, 50 years you know, had not bent the curves at all, that would be, to me, that would be cause for such fatalism. Then I'd say, well, then why do anything? Because mm -hmm. nothing matters. So, uh, you know, I think the real story is that, again, that changes in consumption, changes in production, slowing population growth, uh, technical innovation, all these things have made a very big difference and in many cases uh, 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 favorable. So, but what I would say, so, as I remarked about Bismarck, I think, I think we, or let me change the metaphor. Hmm. You know, if those people are interested in psychiatry, you know, there's always there's the problem of transference, where instead of sort of trying to uh, deal with the actual problem, you just become in, engaged in your relationship with the psychiatrist. And uh, <laughs> and I, I, I have spent. <laughs> <laughs> Having spent a decade in Washington, I feel like there's this big problem in America and many other countries where we transfer to politicians in the political system our hopes. There's a great book called On Power, written in occupied France, actually, during World, World War II, by Bertrand de Juvenal. And in it, he says, politics is the last repository of hope. And I feel a lot of the time <laughs> that we, we, we think, well, if we just pass a law or if America signs a treaty, that solves the problem, and therefore that, that I have no responsibility. Uh -huh. And uh, I think that's a very dangerous attitude, and I think too many people in the so-called democracies have just sort of transferred, uh, and like psychiatrists, they, I, I think public policy most of the time doesn't really work. Uh -huh. So... Um, so, uh, so you have to be. You, you need a mix. Again, you need. So you need e-reader. You need all these. You need all. It's part of the mix. But you, this idea that you know, again, legislators or right, you just sign this thing and it solves the problem. It doesn't. So it's part of a much more complex system. And you know what? The good things that I've described are the outcome of of a variety of actions of of uh, companies and producers realizing they'd make more money if they made more efficient use of the resource. You know, the famous armor meat packing, we package everything but the squeal. So, so you, know, if, uh, if, you know, if you don't throw away a lot of, uh, you know, of stuff, you know, if you use all the textile or the metal or whatever. So, so, you know, producers can do things that are more efficient. Consumers can change their behaviors. Governments and public policy can do things too. But, but I think one has to be... Uh, uh, you know, so I, I think I, I don't think it's fatalism at all. I think it's trying to make the various actors in the society all take some responsibility. I'm trying to, you know, I'm a lifelong conservationist and sort of was part of the environmental movement getting started, the current one in, in the 70s. And I think what throws a lot of us when you say this stuff is that we didn't do that. Now, we didn't uh, level off population. Uh, that was done by urbanization and by you know, people going for prosperity and better jobs and all this kind of stuff. We saved the whales, take a bow. Uh, but uh, you know, Steve Jobs and Jeff Bezos, both of whom I know, well, probably would have been glad to hear that their inventions would mean fewer trees being cut down. Uh, but they would also say that has nothing to do with why people buy these products I'm designing. And so it's this inadvertent greening going on that we're not sure what to do with our heads in relation to that. You know, a lot of people have dedicated, as you've done, uh, their lives to trying to make uh, conservation happen and, and environmental responsibility happen. And then you say, well, actually, well, it's just going on anyway. And we go, well, now what? Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we, we can't take a bow for that. Uh, sometimes the good news alarms us because we didn't do it. 
We didn't raise money for it. We didn't, you know, it isn't an organization that we work with that made that happen. Uh, so there's a, a little bit of feeling left out. Um, I, I get a sense that there is a shift yeah. going on of how we think about humanity's relationship to nature that is having to embrace the scope and scale and indeed speed of what you've been saying is going on and in a sense working with it and not feeling disconcerted by it but just saying, wow, great. <laughs> don't have to do that one, it's taken care of. Let's focus on this other issue here, like the oceans. Does that make sense? Yes, well, that, you know, that's why I think the, the, you know, Bismarck, who was a very successful politician, was astute about how, you know, you basically, you want to ride the good waves. And uh, so, you know, I think in most cases, uh, that's really what, what uh, successful leadership is about. So, so uh, you know, some people, uh, well, I'd say, well, free will is a sacred cow, you know, so it's, everybody wants to believe in more free will than I think really exists. You know, if, if you, there are famous studies, for example, about marriage and the, the uh, marriages and the, 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 uh, the probability of the, uh, the, of the person you'll marry, I mean, basically you marry people who are near to you and the best predictor, this may be less true now with aviation and so forth, but there were very thorough studies done and, you know, if somebody lives a quarter of a mile from you or a half a mile from you or a mile or 10 miles, you know, like there's a direct, perfect relationship between the probability that you'll marry and... Uh, so, you know, but everybody likes to think, you know, it, you know, everything is free. But, but so I, I think there's a... Which is, you know, it's and that, you know, it may make us better human beings in some ways and more risk accepting and adventurous and entrepreneurial. Uh, you know, if you really understand the statistics of business creation, you might not really want to start a business and so forth. So, uh, or a marriage or any other. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I think. Have a life, uh, have a baby. Yeah. So, you know, in some sense, uh, you know, getting, getting the sort of right mix of appreciating the power of the system and still appreciating what freedom of action we really have, that's, a, that's very, very important. And again, I think great leaders have that, or, and great organizations have that. It's not, it's not always just a leader. So, you know, the, the, uh, but, you know, there, there are these very powerful uh, trajectories that extend over centuries mm -hmm. that are not you know, are not the res that are not controlled by individuals or small groups of people. So, if we recognize some of those things, it's you know, I, you know, I, I sometimes like to say, "Don't forget the system; it won't forget you." Yes. So, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.